Men, welcome back. Pastor Randy here again. So I just, I, I first I want to start off with um, a thought uh, that I have from, uh, from my time in the Word this morning. I was in uh, 1 Kings chapter, uh, well, I was in 1 Kings chapter 12, like through 14, but um, the statement, it was talking about Jeroboam, the, the, my thought about is about Jeroboam. So King Jeroboam, okay, um, God took the, the kingdom away from Solomon and, and he gave um, part of the kingdom um, most of the kingdom to Jeroboam and part of it to Rehoboam and and so but there's a statement in 1 Kings chapter 12 that says this about Jeroboam um, let me back up let me back up God told Jeroboam that I will give you all that you want to reign over I'll give you all the kingdom that you want I'll give you Israel um, Jeroboam, I'll give you an enduring kingdom. I'll give you an enduring kingdom. Just follow my ways and, and follow my commands and do what I tell you to do. Uh, what an amazing promise that I'll give you an enduring kingdom. Um, a kingdom includes uh, property. A kingdom includes uh, people. Um, uh, he'll give you an enduring kingdom, Jeroboam. He told that to Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 11. And then in 1 Kings chapter 12, one chapter later, it says this statement. Jeroboam thought in his heart. He thought in his heart. What did he think in his heart? He thought these people, um, if they continue to go to Jerusalem, which Jerusalem, Rehoboam was still uh, king. If they continue to worship in Jerusalem, they're going to be led to Rehoboam and go away from me, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be their king anymore. Wait a minute, Jeroboam. Wait a minute. Why are you thinking that? God already told you that He will give you an enduring kingdom. Just do what He tells you to do. But Jeroboam thought a lie in his heart. He kept a lie in his heart that said, "If I don't act, if I don't do something clever." These people are going to go away from me, and I'm not going to be able to be their king anymore. And so what he did, what did he do? He made two golden calves, um, set one at the northern territory of his kingdom and one at the southern territory of his kingdom, and said, uh, "Israel, these are the two. These are the gods that brought you up out of Egypt. Go worship here." Uh, either at the northern site or the southern site, go worship here uh, at these golden calves. Re Jeroboam, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're going against what God told you to do. And therefore, God, you know, God took his kingdom away. But um, so here's, here's a thought. So Jeroboam was a king. He's reigning over a kingdom. You're not a king, but guess what? Chances are you're a man watching this. Um, and <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm guessing just since these are men only videos, obviously whoever wants to pop in can can watch these videos. But but if if you are a man and a husband and father, if you have a family, you're watching this and you have a family. Please take this to heart. The things that you're believing, the things that you're thinking in your heart. They will lead you to do certain things. Make sure that you're not trading the truth of God for a lie. Because if you trade the truth of God for a lie, you're going to start acting and treating your wife and your family in ways that you should not do. You should not be treating and acting um, uh, towards your family in this way. You should not be leading them based on lies that you're believing. So make sure that the things that you're believing in your heart are truth and from God's word, okay? Because let me give you a promise. If you if you will follow God's word and do as he commands, you will be the man and the leader for your family that God wants you to be.
and God will bless that. Nope, I didn't promise that your family will be perfect. Nope, I didn't promise that your family will will have great success in 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 the worldly eyes, in the world's eyes. But I promise you that you will be the leader uh, that that your family needs and the leader that God expects you to be if you are believing truth in your heart and doing what God wants you to do. Okay, there's my thought for you today based on my time in the Word. But uh, today we're going to read a little bit more from Tender Warrior. We're on chapter 4, which in my book is page 51. Tender Warrior, chapter 4, okay? This is titled, Staying Power, A Man's Greatest Strength. It has, uh, it has a scripture that says from Jesus, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Okay, here it goes. Just a few times in your life, you meet a man who stops you in your tracks. His presence fills a room. Charismatic, but substantive. Confident, but humble. Authoritative, but gracious. Exuding strength, but inviting companionship. He seems to have spent a lifetime at the headwaters, drunk deeply from the sources of masculinity. The more you learn of him, the more there seems to be. His character calls you to follow him. His success speaks well of him. His family reflects the quality of his leadership. This is the kind of guy you want to have breakfast with. Take fishing, get to know, learn from, emulate. This is a man who is just that, a man. Years ago, I had the privilege of meeting such a man, a landholder, rancher, and community leader. He was the most respected and influential individual in the entire region. But his greatest interest was his large, active family. In spite of enormous demands, there was always time for that tribe of his. His children were never in an interruption. In fact, any conversation with him eventually included references to the kids. He realized that despite his enormous wealth, the only real legacy of any importance he would leave this world would be his sons and daughters, and he had an unusually well-developed sense of spiritual things. He seemed to own a vision much larger than himself. He had a sense of for eternity. This guy had it all. The blessings every man desires were all his. Wealth, honor, family, health. And underneath it all, like bedrock, a sterling character. His name was Job. <laughs> I met him in the oldest pages of scripture in a book that bears his name. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. It was a tradition. They were a close-knit outfit. On every birthday, the gang celebrated together. They belonged to each other, and the anchor in the middle was Dad. And it came about when the days of feasting had completed their cycle that Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps... My sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. The man from Uz carried his family in his heart. Even when the children had become adults, he carried them deep in his soul. And through his days, down through the years, he prayed for them, thinking, The kids seem to be doing all right, but maybe I'm missing something. Everything looks okay on the outside, but only God sees the heart. Who knows? Maybe one of them is teetering on the edge. Maybe one of them is facing a difficult choice today that would lead him away from God's plan. Job did this continually. The man's life was marked by his commitment to his family. 
in this, the oldest book of the oldest book of the book, we get a look at a man who could still wet his beard near the ancient headwaters of masculinity. The kingly blood of original man still coursed through his veins. Job was a provisionary, and even though he was likely very generous, that provision went far beyond material goods. By daily praying for his own his grown children and carrying them in his heart, he was always looking ahead, always squinting toward the horizon, looking down the trail, scouting out potential dangers and hazards. The story goes on, verse 8, Somewhere in the heavenlies, the Lord himself is holding court. He is speaking to Satan, the great adversary of all men and families. This man, Job, occupies their conversation. The Lord says, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Satan shrugs. He replies in effect, Sure, he's one of your good guys. Of course he's tight with you. He's got all the advantages. Who wouldn't be? You handled him with kid gloves. But just trying to take a few of his precious by just trying to take a few of his precious toys and then see how the tale reads. You know the story from there. For reasons beyond our comprehension, Satan is given some freedom to do what he relishes most destroy a man's life. He's on a leash, of course. He can go only so far. But for a brief season, he is authorized to lay a dark hand on this good man's life. Given opportunity, he turns all his ugliness on Job. In a series of life-blasting catastrophes, Job loses his business, his wealth, his health, and all ten of his dearly loved children. At the peak of his agony, his wife mocks and lashes out at him. His friends jeer and accuse him, and heaven suddenly falls silent. The God whom Job so faithfully serves seems away from his desk. Job's urgent calls and cries are routed into cosmic voicemail. The worthy rancher from the land of Uz suddenly finds himself as alone as a man can be. The question before the reader, the Lord, the devil, and the ages, is a strong one. Will Job remain a man, a real man? Will, will he wilt? Will he fall apart? Will he cut and run? Will he cash in the one thing he has left? His character, the essence of a man. Some things can be taken away, some cannot. I recall my first extended time away from home. It was my freshman year in college. Having never be before been east of Idaho, I now faced the prospect of an entire semester in a strange land called Illinois. It might as well have been Siberia or Mars. It felt like forever. For a youngster accustomed to the mountains of the West, it seemed as though Illinois had no horizons. The gray, flat land and the dreary days seemed to drone on into eternity. I wanted nothing more than to come home. I dreamed of it, longed for it, framed a thousand valid reasons for bagging school and heading West, but for reasons I couldn't even articulate at the time, I stayed with it. At last, after months of numbing endurance, <laughs> I arrived in home country. As I stepped from the train, Dad emerged from the crowd and shook my hand. I'll never forget what he said. Son, you have something no one can ever take away from you. It's on the inside. You stuck it out. You've done some growing up. He was right. People, events... Evil schemes, disasters, catastrophes can take things away from you, things on the outside, but no one can ever take away what's on the inside. Hard, <laughs> okay, I'm going to reread that, okay? But no one can ever take away what's on the inside. Heart, soul, character. 
A man can throw it away, but no one can ever take it away. That was the question before Job, and that is the question before every man. When things around you are taken away, what will happen on the inside? Where you live with yourself. Will character survive? Job proved his manhood. Out of his story comes what we have called for the centuries the patience of Job. I think that's selling it short. Job demonstrated something longer and stronger than patience. Shining out of his life through the dark horrors of grief and loss is what I believe to be a man's greatest strength, his highest attribute. Call it patience if you like. I call it staying power. What is staying power? In his letter to scattered and suffering Christians, James tagged that same quality, endurance. A literal rendering yields the phrase staying under, remaining, persevering, holding fast, standing firm. That's what a man does. That's what a man is. The military equivalent of staying under probably finds its ultimate fulfillment in an institution called Army Ranger School. As a young Army officer, I had been called on to endure unbelievably rigorous training before being shipped out to Southeast Asia. In the middle of my tour in Vietnam, I often wondered how on earth could a guy survive this if he didn't have Ranger School. The whole point of that training was to help us overcome our most basic fears so that we could function no matter what kind of pressure or circumstances we would face in our future duties. The physical, mental, and emotional stress they put us under defies description. We went for days on end with little, if any, sheep. Stayed out. Uh, okay, I just said sheep. That's not what it says. I'm going to reread that sentence too. We went for days on end with little... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what a dork. Okay. <laughs> we went for days on end with little, if any, sleep. With any... if uh, Sleep. Stayed out for days on end with little, if any, food. As I pen these words, I can picture our little company at 4.30 in the morning, what we called in the military, Oh Dark 30, crawling along on our bellies under logs and through mucky, water-filled trenches. Late afternoon would find us staggering with exhaustion and bleeding from the feet after forced marches of endless miles. And just when we thought we were going to expire, some officer would be in our face screaming, Drive on, Ranger! Drive on! Through it all, we we began to find out something about the limits of man's mind and body. We could get along without food. We could function without sleep. We could go a day after day after day, even on past the end of our frayed rope. They proved to us that we could do what we had to do. Job would have done well in ranger school because he exhibited an enormous staying power. Think of it. He was a man whose masculinity rested not in what he owned, not in the size of his home, not in the amount of his investments, not in what he could perform, not in what he could achieve, not in people he knew, not in the model of donkey he rode, not in his status in the community. Job proved himself quite apart from decorations and tributes and trophies and newspaper clippings. Job sourced his masculinity and personhood in who he was, alone and naked before God, and that makes a man out of you. There was a sense of permanence in Job. He was strong, stable, secure, consistent throughout. What you saw was what you got. Whether he had the visible trappings of God's blessing or not, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, Job stayed. Sounds like a marriage vow, doesn't it? For good reason. You see that marriage covenant and the spirit of those words are at the core of man's manhood. A man's greatest strength in his capacity to stay by the stuff. To make and keep promises. 
A man's word connects. A man's word stays. A man's word stays. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the, read the next, uh, next uh, short paragraph and statement, and then we'll be done. At one point, the old patriarch vows, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Standing tall in the fierce winds of hell itself, Job refuses to turn from his commitment, and that is masculinity, pure and unadulterated. But men aren't staying. That's where we're going to stop for now. Um, men, <laughs> let's be men who stay. Let's pray about that, and then, uh, and then next time we pick up this book, we'll continue on from there. Men, where are you? Where are you tempted to not stay? Is it your marriage? Is it your? Is it your faith? Um, where are you tempted to not stay? Are you? T uh, is it purity? Where are you tempted to not stay? Can I encourage you, men? Hang on, hang on. And if you need to, if if you're tempted to not stay, reach out for help. Call a friend, uh, email or text me. Um, and and but let's be men who stay, have staying power. Let's be men who be real men, chasing after Christ and allow Christ to put His staying power into each one of us. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for guys like Stu Weber who write books to help us uh, understand what true masculinity is. Father, would you make me into a man that has staying power? Would you help us be the men that you've designed us to be so that we can have the staying power for our families, for our church families, and for our community that you want us to be? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Men, thanks for joining me today. Um, I look forward to talking to you soon.